All right, well, hello everyone and welcome to our second wild care happy hour of the winter season here. Tonight we're going to get to chat with people who are involved with the Center for Avian Conservation in the Pacific Islands. And I am so excited for this one. It's going to be a lot of fun. I hope that you all brought your Ozark Hellbender wine from Stonehill Winery. A portion of the proceeds goes to the St. Louis Zoo and Hellbender Conservation. So uh, there was also a golden white eye cocktail you could have made. And I hope you're just enjoying whatever you'd like to enjoy while you watch along with me this evening. So before we get started, I just wanna make sure that you all know there are two functions down at the bottom of your screen. One of them is the chat. That is where you can chat with each other about how much you love the conservation in the Pacific Islands. And the Q&A is for questions. So the Q&A is where we will be monitoring for all of the lovely things you'd like to know and hear from our panelists this evening. Um, and the chat is where we probably won't monitor as closely. So make sure that those questions go in the Q&A. So, uh, now it's time to get started. I will bring on Carrie Lammering, the Conservation Education Liaison with the Bird Department. And she's going to give us a little bit of a background, and then we're going to watch a video from Toledo Zoo that will give us a little bit more in depth about the background of the Center for Avian Conservation Pacific Islands. Hi everyone, I am very excited to be uh, with you today and talk about this amazing project that I have been so fortunate uh, to be part of as uh, all the other panelists will be. And Emily, you wanna go ahead and give the first slide. Um, to kind of understand the Center for uh, Avian Conservation in the Pacific Islands, it's helpful to know where we are talking about. Uh, so on our first slide, I, we can show you where that is located. Um, because when I first uh, was offered to go like to become part of this program, I did not know where the Pacific Islands were. I thought, well, sounds like it's in the Pacific Ocean somewhere. But uh, to hear to understand its story, its position is is very important. And it is located, I don't know if Emily is able to get the PowerPoint up. Um, it is positioned uh, between Hawaii and Japan. And you may know of some of these islands, you may have heard of Tinian or Rhoda or uh, Saipan because of World War II. And I know Emily's working on getting the PowerPoint uh, to share. Um, so, the uh, between Japan or between Hawaii and Japan are these uh, chain of islands, and they were a very strategic uh, battleground for World War II. And that is maybe where you have heard their name before, because some very significant battles were fought there. And because there were these significant battles fought there between Japan and the United States, the uh, flora and fauna of the Marianas Islands was dramatically changed because of these battles. Now, you may also notice that down below uh, where Saipan is on the map is um, Australia. So there was uh, goods and supplies coming up from Australia to give to the military. And on those cargo boats accidentally was a stowaway called the brown tree snake. And you've heard of snakes on a plane. This was snakes on a boat. And they came onto the island and they had a heyday because they had no natural predators. And so they decimated the bird population on those islands. And here you can see in the picture, those were the runways. This is uh, Tinian, one of the small islands that we do work on. And those runways are still there. Those are the runways in which the Enola Gay and the other plane took off that dropped the bombs, the atomic bombs. And so that is a, to me, it's one of those, it's a nasty part of our history, but coming out of this is um, some great conservation work because we are trying to help restore what had been lost um, earlier. So now I'm gonna turn it over to 
uh, video and then Matt Schomberger to tell you more about this amazing work that that team is doing. Okay, I think while Emily is trying to get our technology figured out, um, I don't know if Matt wants to jump in, we can tell you a little bit about the work that they are doing. And again, it's all based because of this extreme loss of uh, bird species because of this introduced brown tree snake. And Matt, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Carrie. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, how we catch uh, the birds that are being moved to different islands and how we take care of them before their transport. And then my uh, manager, coworker, Amanda Burr, will tell you about how the actual translocation, which is what we call the transporting them uh, to different islands happens. And then also Kayla Garcia and Carrie Lammering have other uh, components of the program to share with you. Um, <clears throat> so uh, as Carrie mentioned, this is all due to fear of the brown tree snake um, impacting these islands and um, so far, there's been very few sightings of the brown tree snake on those islands, which is great, but it also tells the uh, people that live there and uh, people on the Fish and Wildlife Department for the Northern Mariana Islands that there is a potential problem because anytime boats and planes are moving around from island to island, there's always little stowaways. Um, so certainly, they're always vigilant about it and they're always looking for it. It's kind of funny because we don't think about um, these invasive species too much, even though they're we have them here on the mainland United States as well. But um, all you have to do at any time is look in the newspaper and see how impactful invasive species have been in Florida. And you kind of get a scope of like some of the problem that's being faced out in the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, um, sometimes abbreviated as CNMI. So, um, so there's a, another map, it just shows you the island chain. It's a 14 island chain and it extends about 400 nautical miles. Um, Guam is actually a separate country. You can see on the map there, um, Guam is just directly south of the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands or CNMI. Um, but again, Guam is a separate country. Probably ge geographically, it's all just part of the same island chain, right? But it is a, a separate country. Um, but Guam's a US territory and the Marianas Islands, Northern Mariana Islands are a Commonwealth of the United States. Um, and you can Wikipedia the differences between those two. It's kind of fascinating what separates a commonwealth from a US territory. Um, but that's just kind of again, and so most of our work is done on Saipan and Tinian, which are um, right down there closer to Guam. And, um, and then the translocation, uh, which Amanda will go into, occurs on some of those other islands to the north of Saipan and Tinian. Uh, next slide, please. So um, just to give you an idea, like the climate of these islands is like Hawaii. I am really fortunate. I've been to both places in my life. I've been to Hawaii and uh, Northern Marianas. And so I can confirm for you that the climate is very much the same. The, um, the coral reefs are very much the same. The great thing about the Northern Mariana Islands is they don't get as many tourists as Hawaii. So that's almost kind of like seeing how Hawaii may have been a few decades ago or um, before tons and tons of tourists got there. But the climate's very similar. Um, definitely a tropical island. Next slide, please. Um, and this just gives you a little bit more too about the population. So there's a, one of the hotels on the right that we stay in when we're there. We're definitely not roughing it. We're not camping in tents. Um, we certainly we do field work and we're out in the out in the natural environment for most of the day, uh, 10 to 12 hours a day. But we could stay in hotels and there's uh, air conditioning and and um, everything on the islands. Certainly the islands are small, so they don't have uh, they're not huge hotels necessarily, or at least on Tinian. But Saipan gets a lot of tourists. They get a lot of tourists from Japan and South Korea and Australia. And so they have lots of larger hotels on Saipan, which is the largest island, has the largest population. But and then the picture to the left, you know, they got restaurants. They've got uh, both chain restaurants like you can find an IHOP there. You can find a McDonald's there, um, but you can find local restaurants, too. So um, and, and it's very um, in that way, it's very 
similar to America. It's got a lot of American influence there as well. Next slide, please. So um, one of the first things that struck me when I went there and um, I went two years in a row. In fact, usually when we go and do field work, we do two years in a row just because um, the first year you're learning how to do it and the second year um, they get to benefit from you already kind of knowing what you're doing. Um, but you can see from the picture on the left that um, that's almost the entire island uh, of uh, Saipan that we were flying over. Now, granted, it's, only, it's truly only about three quarters of it, but these aren't big islands. And as Emil, or Carrie already mentioned, they're way out there in the middle of the Pacific. And certainly I knew they were small islands, but it's not until you're flying over and coming into land that you realize just how small they really are. So that also gives you an idea of just how, um, uh, how they can easily be impacted, whether it's by a typhoon and hurricane or by something like an invasive species, it doesn't take much. And um, when you move around from island to island, there's no ferry boat service. So you often fly in these really tiny little planes that hold like four or five passengers at a time. Um, and that's the picture of me on the right. Uh, literally the only way to get into that particular plane for me was to be in the cockpit with the pilot, which was super cool. But um, also they, uh, the way they get you on the plane is by weight. So they have you, every passenger has to be weighed with their luggage and you each get a different like color coded card, depending if you're kind of like big, medium size or thin. And the guy comes in or a woman comes in uh, for the next flight and looks at everybody and is like, uh, you, you, you and you. And then you get on there and it's all based on enough weight to fly you over there, but also get off the ground. So it's, it's pretty intense. Next slide, please. Um, Oh, and one thing I should say about the flights is, of course, to get there, we originally flew on big commercial jets. It takes about um, 20, 20 to 24 hours to get there, but then it's when you're moving between islands that you fly on the smaller plane. So I just wanted to clarify that. Now, the floor on the islands, it's mostly secondary forest. As Carrie already mentioned, um, during World War II, there was a lot of activity there, and they often decimated a lot of the foliage. Um, just to create runways and create places for buildings and stuff like that and, and also remove hiding spots for enemy soldiers. So um, most of the forest now is definitely, it's not the original forest that was there. It's all secondary forest. So those are a couple of photos that give you kind of an impression of what that looks like. And this, the photo on the right, um, that glob right in the middle is actually a nest of one of the birds that we um, helped to try to save, which is the Tinian monarch. And that's one of its nests right there. Next slide, please. So again, this is, uh, Carrie already showed a nice slide of those runways. And we use those runways to get in and out to the field. And as you can see, that secondary forest is already trying to overtake those runways. And I always find that so fascinating that, you know, the moment that some of our human activity stops, um, nature wants to go ahead and do what it should do, which is kind of like reclaim it and, and take it over. And definitely that's what's happening on those runways there too, as the forest is trying to not only uh, come across it, but bust it up right through the asphalt. Next slide, please. So when we um, catch the birds, we use mist nets. Um, there is a mist net right there between me in the foreground and my uh, friend Josh Miner in the background. Um, but as you can see, the mist nets are difficult to spot. And um, that's because you want it to be difficult for the birds to spot also. In order to be able to catch the birds, um, they're wild birds after all, and so you need them to fly into these nets. Um, if you've never seen a mist net before, think like a badminton net or a volleyball net, except that it has um, more than one fold that creates like a pocket for the bird to land in when it, um, when it falls into the net uh, or when it hits the net, then it kind of drops down into the pocket. Um, so Certainly we are often targeting just like one or two species of birds to move to other islands per year. And it also varies from year to year which birds we target. Um, all the decision-making as far as what birds to target and stuff was already made by the Fish and Wildlife Service of the Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands in conjunction with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and various zoos. But that's, that's already all been decided by their biologists as far as which birds we should go for how many birds we need to translocate per year and so on. But um, just because you're trying to target only two species doesn't mean you're not gonna catch other birds in the nets too. So the bird I'm holding there is a collared kingfisher. They're very ubiquitous on the island chain. They're kind of one of the top predators out there. 
Um, if you think of, you need to remember that these islands um, evolved and came about without uh, mammalian predators on them. So the reptiles and the birds were the top predators. And so collared kingfisher is certainly one of the top predators in the forest out there. So the kingfishers tend to get in the net and they usually get in the net because they're actually often trying to fly at and capture a different bird that's already landed in the net. Um, and then they get themselves caught as well. I like kingfishers a lot. And I can tell you that every collared kingfisher is extremely feisty when you go to get them out of the net, as you can tell by the appearance on that bird's face. Um, trying to get them out of the net is also tricky because certainly any one of the birds, they get a little bit tangled up in the mesh of the net. And so taking them out is a very delicate procedure, but you also need to do it relatively quickly so the birds, uh, the stress to the bird is minimized. So uh, next slide, please. Once we get the birds, um, we bring them, uh, well, they, when we're out in the field, again, we're out in the field for 10 to 12 hours. So when we catch the birds, um, one by one, they get looked over, they get like kind of a brief ID number and they get put in these little boxes, like the ones you see in the photos behind you. And um, they're kept out in the field, not those exact boxes, but they're kept in similar boxes just out in the field. And um, it's some, it's one person's job because there's a team of people from a variety of zoos working on this project each time. And so uh, one person will literally um, drive the birds back into town every couple hours so that they're not just sitting out there with us. And um, so one person's job is to kind of be the shuttle driver or the Uber or the Lyft for these birds. And um, so you catch a few and then they come out and get a few and take them back into town and you catch a few more. And, um, it's kind of hit or miss from day to day how many you might get. Um, if they tell you to get 50 Mariana's fruit doves, it might take you um, two whole weeks to get that many, or if you get lucky, you might get all your 50 fruit doves in about a week or a week and a half. But in the meantime, you got to take care of them. And so the rooms that you see here in these photos are literally one of the rooms in the hotels where we stay that we rent out and um, we set it up as a bird room to take care of the birds while they're um, waiting to be translocated because uh, we can't, certainly we can drive them from the field site to the town but when we're moving them from one island to another island, they need to all go at once. And so we have to keep them fed, to keep them uh, watered and so on. And um, that's a challenge because again, these are wild birds. They're not used to being taken care of by humans. They're not used to eating the food that we're giving them. And so you have to kind of get them adapted to that. Any bird that after a couple of days um, is not thriving in our situation, is released back into uh, the forest on Saipan or in, on the forest of Tinian. We don't want any of the birds to um, die while they're in our care. And so any bird that's not gaining weight or not adapting to our food uh, gets released after a few days. And that's all monitored carefully. We, the birds get weighed every day. We don't even have to have them in hand. You can just weigh them um, by placing a scale um, into those little boxes and they land on a perch that triggers the scale weight off and then we can see it. And um, there's veterinaries on duty. That's a vet there in the picture on the left, on the left-hand side, that's one of the veterinarians the year that I went. And so they were always monitoring their health and trying to be as hands-off as possible once we have them in those little boxes. Those little boxes are kind of like um, shaded bird cages, small bird cages for like parakeets and stuff, but they're obviously a little bit different. Um, otherwise, many of the birds do adapt to our diet and they do adapt to that. And it's just a matter of continuing to monitor their health, their weight, so that they're ready for the transport when we get the birds that we need to get and go. Next slide, please. So as far as field work, this is kind of a panoramic shot. You can see that we're working really hard out there. Um, actually, what's happening is you obviously for the birds to get into the nets easiest. You don't need to be standing around the nets, but the nets need to be checked about every 10 to 15 minutes because it's hot out there in the island, especially if the sun's out. And um, you, and especially if birds like collared kingfishers are diving into the net to try to get after the birds too. And so, so we take turns and we walk the nets every 10 to 15 minutes. You, this photo just happens to catch us on a break of checking the net lanes. That's what we call them. There's more than one net up at any given time. We usually have an, anywhere from uh, oh, 10 to 20 nets up at a time. The nets all have numbers, so we know which net is which. We record which nets are catching birds and which are not. Sometimes we move nets to different locations to better our chances. Um, the one number that we don't 
used for nets is uh, 13. And um, you'd like to think that might be because of superstition of bad, uh, it being bad number. But in actuality, uh, net 13 is a code word for um, when you need to go use, uh, relieve yourself in the woods. There's no porta potties out there. There's no restrooms out there. So that's what net 13 is. Um, and usually for newbies, it's always funny to ask them to go check net 13 for you or something like that. So there's, there's a lot of fun with that. Um, we certainly joke around with each other, get to know each other while we're out there in the field. And there are always plenty of very experienced people there to train folks that are new um, and, and work off of it that way. Um, otherwise, when you're out in the field, you definitely, we take our food with us. We take plenty of Gatorade and water and try to stay as hydrated as possible. Because again, some days you're out there a fairly long time. And um, again, much like Hawaii or much like Florida, it tends to rain at least once or twice a day, sometimes for a long period of time, sometimes for a short period of time. And, um, and then sunshades help out a lot too. Next slide, please. And so now um, I'm gonna turn this over to Amanda Burr and she's gonna tell you just how we transfer those birds to the different islands. Perfect, thanks, Matt. Um, and so I'm gonna be telling you specifically about, um, more specifically about the 2019 translocation because I was lucky enough to be on the transport boat um, in previous years, sometimes the bird are even transported by a helicopter, but this year happened to be a boat. So that's what I'm gonna tell you about today. Uh, next slide. So after all of the work that Matt has just described, uh, it's finally translocation day. It's time to move these birds that we've worked so hard to collect to their new home on another island, and in this case, Alamogon. So we're gonna be moving them from their single bird apartments on the left. Uh, they were all housed individually uh, before that in the bird room to these six bird transport crates that you see in the center photo. So before they go into those crates, they're looked over one last time and uh, just to make sure that they're still looking healthy and well and bright eyed and ready for their long journey. Um, but we're also double checking their bands. All those birds are banded um, before we release them on the island and all that information is documented. Um, so all the way to the right, you'll see a photo of all those transport crates that we've already loaded full of birds um, and they're getting ready to be put um, into the cars to take to the dock. Next slide. So here we are loading those crates um, into the cars and then we just drive them right down to the marina and get them loaded onto the big boat, which is the center photo there. So we first just kind of get them onto the boat to get them out of the sun and you can see them just kind of lined up there on the bench and then we'll carefully stack them and strap them down in the back. Um, and you'll notice those little flaps are kind of flipped up. There's like a cloth flap that was previously covering the screen, but now we want those up so that we can monitor those birds throughout the whole duration of their boat trip. Uh, next slide. So that was actually my bunk in the center there. That's where I slept uh, the two nights uh, to get out to Alamogan and then return back, back to Saipan. So, next slide. So several song filled hours later, we would arrive um, at the island and I say several song filled hours because seriously, we had a crew uh, full of Disney fans with us. Uh, so on both boat rides, we were having a lot of fun. And that's another reason why I didn't really have a lot of great photos to share of the boat itself because we were so engaged with the group. Um, being on these trips is kind of like going to summer camp. Like you really become really close to a lot of the people that you're working with. Um, and especially if you're fortunate enough to go out two years in a row, like Matt was saying, a lot of the people um, are also super passionate about the work and you get to hang out with them two years in a row. It's really, really fun. Um, so the mayor of Alamogan was actually on the boat with us. And at one point on the return boat ride, he did offer me a beer out of a cooler where they were also storing fish that they had caught. So it was covered in like fish goo and blood. But hey, if the mayor of Alamogan offers you a beer, you don't say no. So of course I drink it. We also ate two boxes of extra toasty Cheez-Its because that just so happened to be the favorite comfort food of myself and Ann Heitman, who was uh, along with us from Cedric County Zoo. Um, the first night out, we had an absolutely stunning sunset followed by, I'm not exaggerating, a trillion stars. If you've ever had the opportunity to be out in the open ocean um, and see 
just 180 degree horizon to horizon and 360 degrees around you of stars. It's astounding. It was really breathtaking. Um, the trip itself from Saipan to Alamagan took about 14 hours. The captain of the boat did stop just outside Alamagan and I think it waited for us for a couple hours just for the sun to start to come up. Um, but you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So soon, uh, this is what we saw as the sun was coming up. This is Alamagan as we approached its shores. It was really exciting. Um, after all that work and anticipation to like get the birds there, you could just feel like the energy building in the crew. We were really excited. We were monitoring these birds the whole time during the boat ride and we are excited to get them to their final destination. Next slide. So this is the last leg of their journey. Um, and remember this tiny island is out in the middle of the Pacific. There's no dock that we're pulling up to with this giant boat. So we take a tinier boat off of the big boat and put it in the water and then we carefully cart um, and get those, um, those foxes on shore like three at a time really carefully. So here's Steve Mullen. Uh, he's one of our uh, big collaborators with uh, DFW out there and uh, they're passing those boxes to get them onto the shore. And also re remember that this island chain still has active volcanoes in it. So all of these islands are very volcanic. Um, so the shores aren't sandy beaches either. You're basically walking on like a field of lava and pumice. Um, so not only is it definitely an ankle turner and you're like carrying these boxes of endangered species, you also don't want to fall and drop the birds, but you don't want to fall and like skin half of your leg off <laughs> because it's pretty rough. Um, but it was really exciting just to get the birds off the boats and finally on safe land. Um, next slide. So I wanted to pause here and just have you look at this photo. This, to me, it's one of the most impactful photos that I have. Um, this photo represents weeks and weeks of hard work, hard physical work, physical labor out in the field, out in the sun, catching these birds. And hard work for the birds as well. They're going through the transition of being in human care for the first time and eating new foods and all of that. Um, it also represents a lot of collaboration. Um, it takes a lot of planning to pull off these trips. Um, it takes um, a lot of work by our kind of um, partner organization, Pacific Bird Conservation, to help orchestrate all of the institutions that are involved in supporting this work. Um, and many, many ACA institutions help send staff and support these important translocations. And by extension, uh, it's a lot of support uh, by the donors that help support this conservation work from all of our institutions. Um, and the last thing that I feel like this photo really represents is hope. These boxes house the birds that will help defend the survival and sustainability of their species. And being able to touch that and capture it in a photo for me was really impactful. Next slide. So of course I had to take one obligatory selfie of me next to the boxes that I just ranted about for 10 minutes. But here we are. We finally loaded the boxes on the island and moved them up to the site, um, kind of up above that cliff in that first photo where we did release them. So here's a couple photos of some colleagues opening those tiny doors and letting those birds out um, into the wild on Alamagan. Now, um, not only do we send staff typically two years in a row, but often we're doing kind of back-to-back -back mirror translocations two years in a row. So this one was actually the second year of the Rufus Fantail and Golden White Eye being brought to Alamogan. And I mentioned this because while we were there, uh, we spotted unbanded birds on the island. And remember I told you that all of those birds that we move um, have never been there before and we banned every single one of them. They were in fact reproducing um, on the island. So this second wave will just help bolster that population and hopefully uh, ended birds on island market. So next slide. So this photo uh, is just most of the crew 
after we've released all the birds, we're tired and sweaty and it's the end of our like long journey. It's kind of the pinnacle of everything that we've worked for for weeks while we've been out here in the field. And uh, I just really love this photo. Cammie, uh, Dr. Cami Fox is in the middle. She's at Fort Wayne Children's Zoo and she just looks and I think a part of us felt like that um, following the release of all those birds. So next slide. And so once we released the birds, it was time to kind of celebrate and relax a little bit. So we did some swimming and snorkeling and on the boat ride back, um, the crew that drove the boat was uh, doing some fishing. So you see this giant tuna. It's obviously missing some important bits of its body. It was actually bit in half while they were reeling it in by a shark. It was pretty incredible and exciting to watch. Um, so if you ever wondered what a few hundred dollars worth of fresh sushi looks like on a styrofoam plate, that's what it looks like all the way to the right there. Um, but it was a really fun time. It was, it was nice to just relax and celebrate uh, the translocation work that we had completed. Next slide. And there's just one more gorgeous shot of Alamagan. It was entire life and just being able to personally be involved with that conservation work that I'm so passionate about. Just, it was almost overstimulating. It's kind of mind boggling how beautiful and amazing it was and how awesome I felt that day. But next slide. So I just wanted to quickly give a thank you to the Wild Care Center itself for helping to support this work um, and wanted to thank Ann Tiber, my boss, and my bird team. Um, without Ann allowing me to contribute and participate in this work, I would have never had uh, all this really cool stuff to share with you this evening. And I thank my bird team for holding down the fort um, while I'm away on uh, conservation work. also like to uh, give thanks to our um, collaborators in the field and our kind of uh, partner organization, Pacific Bird Conservation, um, as well as the Division of, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, the Division of Fish and Wildlife in the CNMI. Um, that's my contact information also listed if you have any other questions or want to reach out. And this is Goey number three, whose favorite food was blueberries, by the way. So that's all. I'll go ahead and pass it off to Kayla Garcia next. She's going to talk a little bit about Pertula snails. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so some of you might be, might be wondering, well, what's the connection between birds and snails? And I'm here to kind of explain that to you guys. Um, so in 2019, the same year that Amanda and, and Carrie last went out to Saipan, I was fortunate enough to accompany them um, as part of a sort of um, beginning collaboration process between um, the Center for Avian uh, Conservation in the Pacific and another wild care related center we have that's focused on partula snails. And uh, what, part, what are partula snails? Um, really, they're a fascinating group of these tiny snails um, that are found throughout um, lots of different islands in the Pacific. And they have a really interesting story. And I've made it mostly uh, a big part of my career to really talk about these small animals. And it so happens that some partula are native to Saipan um, and other islands in the CNMI. So we decided that it would be uh, an interesting and hopefully fruitful endeavor to partner between the two programs and hopefully um, start some conservation work with another endangered species of animal that's only found in um, these particular species, only found within Saipan and the CNMI. Um, so partula snails, um, you can see they're not very big. They're about a thumbnail, maybe in size. And what's really interesting about these is starts off with their name. Partula actually comes from um, the Roman deity of childbirth, the actual process of giving birth. Apparently there are lots of Roman deities involved in like uh, uh, fertility and other aspects of this whole process, but this is specifically the act of childbirth. Um, and basically these snails are very different from other snails because they give live birth. 
Um, so each snail um, actually is hermaphroditic. It has male uh, gametes and female gametes. So that comes in handy and I'll explain why later. But each snail um, carries the eggs inside their body and gives birth to one single baby at a time, um, about every four to six weeks. Um, so they're a fairly slow growing snail. Um, this is really different than a lot of other snails that tend to lay like giant egg clusters of like hundreds of babies. These guys only make one baby at a time and they come out perfectly formed as a little tiny, um, little tiny snail. And the picture that I have up here is actually of the Partula that we work with at the zoo. Um, this is a species that's native to Tahiti that we are raising at the zoo to um, release back into the wild. So that's something that we were hoping to maybe see if that would be a possibility for us to do similar work with these snails that are native to Saipan and the Sienna mine. Next slide, please. So I found this really cool picture that um, gives a little bit of historical context to Portula snails in Saipan. Um, this is actually a photo from a very, very um, extensive scientific document that uh, was looking at the different species of Partula found in the island in 1920. And I hope you guys can see this because it's really, really cool. Um, that leaf that that young boy is holding is actually is, is studded in Partula snails. All those little white spots are Partula snails. And the man to the right actually is holding like a whole handful of these snails. They used to be extremely common. Um, unfortunately, um, in recent years, many of the Partula found throughout the Pacific have, um, have experienced drastic population declines, and in many cases, many species have become extinct. Um, and I just threw this quote in here because this is one reason why I went to Saipan in order to look at hopefully expanding our efforts to um, uh, help these snails because a lot of them are disappearing without most people even realizing it. If you look at all the extinctions that have happened since 1500, you know, 50% of those were mollusks, which are things like clams and bivalves and um, snails, octopus. Um, and of that, 40% were terrestrial snails from oceanic islands. So those are things like the partula. Um, and that is a reason, that is the main reason why we're hoping to um, expand our work to include these snails that also happen to be living on these same islands that these endangered birds are living as well. Next slide. So like the birds found in the CNMI, they're one of the main reasons why these snails have had such a huge decline is due to invasive predator species. Um, it's not snakes for these snails, it's actually other snails and worms that are doing most of the damage. Um, the picture that I have here on the left is actually a lineup of giant African land snails or gals um, that I found right outside of the hotel that we were staying at in Saipan. They are found through a lot, throughout a lot of the Pacific Islands, but they were a big problem in Tahiti, which is where the snail that we care for in the St. Louis Zoo is from, um, because they were basically grow out, outgrowing their welcome. They were eating a lot of crops. They were originally introduced because people thought they'd be a good food source. Um, you know, French Tahiti, escargot, there had to be a connection there, right? Um, but what was decided was to introduce a predator snail to try and control these giant snails. As you might have been thinking, that wasn't a very good idea because those predatory snails went right after the partula and proceeded to basically wipe out all but maybe 12 species out of like 70 something species that were found there. So it was a bad idea. Um, and they've ended up in other places like Saipan, um, but I was really it, just fascinated to find these. Um, and I thought I needed to include this picture because they're massive snails. The one that you see in the middle there is one, a living one that I found, and that's not even as big as they get. Um, and they are just kind of hanging out on Saipan. Um, there's, there aren't really any of those predatory snails there, but there is another potential predator and a, and a big predator actually of Partula, which is a species of worm, a flatworm um, that will eat Partula. And this is actually a picture of one on Tahiti um, eating one of the Partula that's found there. Um, they're good predators. They kind of follow the slime trails of snails. So they're very good at catching up to, you know, this, their prey doesn't move very fast. 
And for Partula who breed and reproduce so slowly, it doesn't take much for them to um, you know, have, have big declines in their population. Um, so I wanted to go to, to, to Saipan to talk with some folks about some of the native Partula that are found there. And that's what I did. Next slide, please. I was actually really fortunate to travel to Rhoda, um, which is a neighboring island, basically between Saipan and Guam. And like Matt said, the best way to get in between islands in that area is to fly on very tiny planes. Um, so that was basically my boarding pass in the, in the top corner there. Um, you can kind of wait to get on the plane exactly like he said, they, they uh, arrange people based on weight. And Rhoda um, is another beautiful island in the CNMI. The Chamoran word, Chamoran are actually the um, indigenous people um, who ancestrally are from that area is Luta, which um, is gonna be relevant in the next slide. Um, so we traveled to this island to find some snails. One of the biologists that I ended up um, meeting up with, that's it was his job was to survey all of these islands to look for these snails because it hadn't really been done extensively since that 1920 study. Um, so that's what we did. Next slide, please. As you might imagine, it's kind of challenging to find tiny snails in a forest, um, in a forest where they like to hang out on leaves and other vegetation. So it's kind of like finding a needle in a haystack, especially if there's not a huge number out there. Um, it's, you know, you do your best to try and do a systematic search. Um, and to get to this particular place, it's a lot more, it's a lot more lush than a lot of Saipan. Um, it's a bit uh, wet, it's a bit more wet. There's a lot more bugs, a lot more mosquitoes on Rota compared to Saipan. Um, you know, we all tried to really uh, load up on the bug spray, but I don't like spraying mosquito spray on my face. So they would just attack my face. And I ended up having like lots of different mosquito bites on my forehead, which is really embarrassing. Um, but it was all worth it because um, hiking up this, this to this steep place and looking through all of this lush vegetation, we were successful um, and we did find some Partula snails. Next slide, please. Ah, so these were what we were looking for. And again, they might not look like much, but to me, this was incredible to be able to see Partula snails, a species of which I had been working with back at the zoo in the wild. And I think um, you know, folks who spoke earlier would probably say the, a very similar thing. Um, seeing these snails, these highly endangered snails that are only found in very small areas now um, compared to what they used to be was just amazing. Um, we ended up seeing two particular species. Um, the one on the left is actually an undescribed species. So Partula were very famous um, in, are, are very famous in the field of evolutionary biology because all of those different species having ad ad adapted to different island conditions um, it was a really it's it was a really fascinating way to kind of look at adaptive radiation um, similar to cut you know Darwin's finches basically um, adapting to their in their you know different circumstances. Um, so this species is found only on Rhoda or Luta, um, which is the working name right now for this species. There's some work kind of going on right now to to get that all figured out. But it was uh, really, really amazing to be able to see not just a Partula species, but an undescribed species that due to recent work, it was determined that that was the case. Um, and then the fragile tree snail, which the reason why they're called fragile is because th their shells are so thin, um, you can actually see their bodies through them. So that modeling color that you see there in both that little, little in, uh, juvenile and that adult, that's actually their internal organs that you're seeing through the snail shell. Um, so we were able to see both of these snails. Um, it was amazing. It was an amazing part of an, of an already amazing trip. I was able to help out not just with these snails, but with all aspects of um, the, the bird translocation project, save for actually going on the boat to Alamagan. Um, but uh, uh, it was just, you know, I, I think it was a very successful trip and I'm still in, in communication with these folks and we're still working on ways that we can help support the snails here um, in Saipan and, and Guam, hopefully eventually too. Uh, next slide, please. So just real, real quick. Um, I know we're running close on time, but I also wanted to chat about just a couple other really awesome uh, animals that I saw when I was on Rota. Um, the one that I'm holding, the picture on the left is me holding a coconut crab 
which I was so excited to see. Coconut crabs are basically the largest um, arthropods, so like an in, uh, you know, crab or insect or whatever on the planet. And the one I'm holding, you know, he's not super big, but I was still pretty, I was still stoked to see one. Um, and the middle picture there is actually two um, folks. So if you ever at, if you ever wondered how many field biologists it takes to uh, get a coconut crab off of a leaf, the answer is two, um, because they wanted to get me a closer look. So they were really helpful in getting this really kind of intimidating crab with these giant claws off of this leaf so that I could get a closer look and take a photo. I was so excited to see one. And then just real quick, mammals, we haven't talked about those too much, but there are native fruit bats in the Marianas that are only found there. And this particular one is actually an, was actually an orphan that the biologists were raising there. And this fruit bat um, you know, was eventually released back in the wild. And again, I had never seen a fruit bat up close and you don't see them super often. They are, um, you know, not common due to, due to uh, habitat loss and over hunting. Um, but I just wanted to end on a, on a fuzzy note there. Um, so with that, I think uh, we'll turn it over to Carrie, who's gonna talk to you a little bit about um, the community outreach work that she did while she was there. Hey, thank you so much, Kayla. Um, I will go through this uh, quickly so that we do have time for question and answer. And so community outreach, um, go ahead and have the slide advanced. Uh, so this project has been going on for a long time and these zookeepers and zoo animal health professionals have been uh, coming over from the mainland over to the CNMI to do do all of this amazing work, but the next step you have to do is let the community know what this work is that you're doing. And so these uh, people that education is not always on the forefront of their mind did an amazing job developing a community community outreach uh, program. In the picture on your left, there's a woman with long dark hair and a blue shirt. Her name is Leanne Blinko, and she actually uh, created a program with the public libraries on all three islands in which these uh, field workers could come in and do uh, programming with families uh, in the area to let them know about the work that they're doing and why they're doing it. Most people uh, on the islands are pretty well informed about what happened on Guam. They know that the brown tree snake is an issue, but they don't necessarily um, think about the fact that their birds are only found on those islands and that um, protecting them is of great importance for conservation. And so this is just a way to get the people sort of involved with uh, the work that they're doing and go ahead and advance the slide. So as everybody had talked about with these tiny planes, um, it does have an element of uh, rethinking how you're going to do these community programs because one or two people get to fly between Saipan to Tinian and Rota, and you have to balance yourself with your luggage that very uh, humbling experience where you get to see how much you weigh compared to what you're bringing so you can't bring a lot of stuff so you have to do a big community program with very little things go to the next slide. Um, the program that they developed is successful. Um, they were able to let the community know about the importance of their birds. Uh, they were able to, to talk about the work that they were doing and why they're doing it. And as you can see on that graph uh, on the bottom right, that people uh, were receiving the message about uh, the importance of the birds and how they can help to protect the birds on the islands. Next slide, please. Um, with any good conservation work, um, you have to have an exit strategy. And so the Pacific Bird Conservation Group has a long-term goal of eventually not having all of these keepers coming over from the mainland and all of these animal health experts coming over from the mainland and trying to turn this project over to the local community. Now, with that, there's just a little problem here, and it has to do with, uh, I think, something that happens on a lot of islands. Um, we partner with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, DFW, and most of those biologists that work for the fish and wildlife there on CNMI, most of them are from the mainland. Um, and so they come over and do a couple year shift, and then they leave. Um, and a lot of the kids on the islands, uh, they get uh, education 
and they you can get a four-year degree on Guam, but most of them come over to the mainland and get their degree, and then they stay on the mainland because there's more opportunities for jobs than there are on the islands. So they lose a lot of those opportunities, or a lot of those people that have the higher degrees, they lose them to the mainlands. So one of the things that they wanted to have education come in and do is try to get uh, students involved with the project in the hopes that they may want to come back and work with DFW or work for some of the other local conservation organizations there um, and kind of develop this uh, bigger conservation uh, uh, career choice on the islands. So um, I got to come in and work very strategically with the community, um, the, the public schools there. The reason that we chose the public schools is because we were working with um, the colleges um, on Saipan, but the teachers that are there have a high turnover rate because just like the other jobs on the islands, a lot of those are people coming from the mainland, working for a few years and leaving. So it was very complicated trying to keep up with who your contacts were. But working with the public schools, um, the gentleman in the picture with the bright orange shirt, uh, kind of pinkish orange, uh, he is the um, the science coordinator for the public school system of all of CNMI. He's Chamoran, so we have a constant, uh, a person who's there, knows the community, um, and he, we worked very strategically with him about what is it that the school's looking for. So we had this teacher workshop where it was not just handing curriculum over, it's here's what this project is, here's what they're doing, here's the time of year they're there, what can we offer you? And next slide. Oh, sorry, when I, uh, another meeting I got to have with um, Asap uh, at his office. This is the view from his office. I would never get any work done if this was my view, but I'm from, you know, the Midwest, maybe because he's grown up on the island, he's immune to that, but oh my God, I would literally get nothing done. It's because it's so gorgeous. Uh, next slide. Um, so he had said, the, the team had said, we want to have real experiences, we want to have field trips, we want to take the kids out into the field to get firsthand experience about what is going on with this project. It's something that they don't get to do on a regular basis. And so we were all prepped and ready for uh, 2019 to come out and deliver these field trips. And Super Typhoon U2 came um, in November or December of uh, 2018 and decimated uh, large portions of the island. The place where we did that teacher workshop is pictured on the left. It was the Hopewood Middle School, Hopwood Middle School. And the picture on the right is what that school looked like after the typhoon. And next picture. So this is what the community was dealing with, was broken down schools, uh, homes were lost, people were literally living inside school buses. Um, and we contacted Asap and said, we're scheduled to come out in April. What do you want to do? We've, we've got buses that he helped us to, to get booked. Um, we're like, are we still doing this? And next slide, please. We did it. Um, this shows the resiliency of this community. I am not sure how many other places could do what they wanted to do and pull it off. So what they were at was actually split shift at schools because they didn't have enough uh, schools that were still of sound structural um, to be able to bring kids in. And so the high schoolers were in the morning. So we did the field trips in the morning, got them back to school before that ended. So the middle schoolers could come in for the next shift. Um, so we brought the kids into the field and they did a rotation between what it looked like when we had the birds in our care from the nets and then uh, saw each of the processes uh, in the field. Next slide, please. Um, the kids really uh, had an amazing time inside the um, hotel where we kept the birds in the bird care room. I think the mealworms were the biggest hit because they're just nasty. Uh, I mean, they're great for Kayla. They're wonderful things. Um, so, the kids had these amazing responses to seeing this work, which was exactly what we were there for. It's what the teachers wanted. It hit the spot. Next slide, please. Um, so what we really wanted to do uh, 
and what we were working with with ASAP was that we wanted uh, the, the kids and the teachers to walk away with great ways to protect the birds in their neighborhood, why they're important, and then also that there are career choices that can happen on the island. Next slide, please. Um, instead of working with college interns, again, because we were having this problem with having such a high turnover rate with the professors at the college, we worked with the um, worked with ASAP to develop a high school internship program and these students were paid. Um, they were able to, for two weekends, work in the field with all of our uh, field workers and field biologists. And they had an amazing time. Uh, they all stated that they would do it again. They had a wonderful time. It gave them a new perspective on what career choices are in this field. And uh, we've been stymied by uh, COVID, but we are hoping that in 2022, we can get back out there and continue with this amazing progress that we are making uh, with getting the community involved with this work. Next slide, please. Um, I just threw this one in here um, because the girl behind me is Erin Tate. Um, she is our researcher. She's part of our care team, our conservation and audience research uh, and evaluation team. And I had asked, I've got to say the, the St. Louis Zoo with the bird department and the Pacific Bird Conservation Group was so flexible uh, with me coming in and working with the education program. I brought in Erin because I know that education, I can feel like I'm doing a great job and that I'm meeting the needs, but you have no idea unless you have really good informed evaluation. And so I brought Erin along because she is like the best evaluator that I could think of that would go with us. and. She provided us with all of those great quotes and all of those great uh, results from our work, which is showing us that we're doing the right thing, we're heading in the right direction, and we just need to get back out there and keep it up. Erin's not on this uh, webinar right now just because she is at home with two beautiful uh, twin baby boys. So um, we're in high hopes that she can come back with us on the next trip. So with that, um, I know we only have five minutes left, but I do want to turn it back over to questions. All right, so we could bring back our panelists. I have a couple questions for you all. Um, while we're getting you all back, my first question is, with field work, you inevitably do have a little bit of downtime, sometimes in a town you weren't expecting to be in that's not really a town meant for tourists. Um, so. What are some things that you do when you're not out in the field, when you're out in the Mariana Islands? Um, it's This is mad. It's fun to get to know some of the people that you're there with, because many of the people are from different cities, different zoos, different places. So it's nice to get to meet them. Um, it's nice to get to try the local cu cuisine, um, especially on uh, uh, the islands there. They get a lot of influence from Japan and Korea. And um, certainly they have a lot of American cuisine too, but it's fun to get, get to try different types of food. And, um, and just, I mean, well, I love to go look for birds. So even when I wasn't in the field, I'd go bird watching. Um, so it's fun to do some checking out wildlife too. Yeah, I would agree with Matt. Like, you know, if you want good sushi, that's not super expensive. Saipan is a great place to be. Like maybe not quite as fresh as what Amanda had on her boat trip. Um, but about the next best thing. So that was really, uh, honestly, that was a nice thing. I'm kind of a foodie. So they have a lot of good stuff to eat there too. Um, in the picture I had with Aaron, we went, uh, you can walk to Bird Island, which is kind of, it's somewhat close to where we uh, were doing the collection, um, but walking through the ocean to get there. And um, I know nothing about the ocean because I am from the Midwest. And so we saw all these cool things and I was trying to poke them because I didn't know if it was live or not. Um, and then we immediately after that little excursion, we had a meeting with this conservation group called MENA and they're this amazing organization of only Chamorans. They want it very local. And I told them like, yeah, oh my God. And we were in the water and there was like this slug looking thing and I poked it and it moved. And she said, you don't poke the wild. What are you doing? And I was like, I don't, I don't know, I'm from the Midwest. It was amazing. I know not to poke the wildlife now. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I 
But yeah, I agree um, with Carrie. Pokemon life is sometimes fun. <laughs> you know, you probably shouldn't. But um, I, my first love is aquatics. I I am now more immersed in the bird world, but um, I definitely, if we have enough free time, they usually give us like one half day where we get to go to the beach or do something fun like that. So I love the snorkel and, and see what sort of critters I can find in the sand and in, in the water. Nice. All right, so we have time for one last question very quickly from each of you. Um, what is your most rewarding part of getting to do this field work? I know it's just a light question for the end. Um, I could, mine was pretty easy. Um, getting to work with the Chamorin community and getting to work with ASAP with helping them with something that their kids, their students just aren't getting to be a part of and helping to connect um, with this project. They were so excited. It was a, like literally the teacher evaluation was a hundred percent. We won it again. We were so excited. And just to be that bridge to connect to this cool project, that was, for me, that was like amazing. Yes, I guess similar, similar to Carrie, like I felt really welcomed by everyone that I was around, like everyone was a bird person and I was like the one kind of weird invert person that just happened to tag along. Um, but I mean, I did actually, I do have kind of a little bit of a background in birds, which I didn't touch on, but I'm definitely more in the invert kind of world now. But just the fact that everyone was so um, welcoming, it was so rewarding to be able to just listen to their experiences and to just hear about all the different ways, especially the folks that have been a part of the program for a long time. Um, all of the hard work and the, 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 just the heart and soul that they put into this project was just super rewarding to be able to be a part of and to witness. So for me, I felt like just being a part of it and being able to touch conservation in a very like tactile way was super impactful. A lot of us get into these fields because we're passionate about conservation and we want to make a difference in the world. But when you hold an endangered, endangered species in your hand and physically release it onto another island, it's just something magic about it. Yeah, I agree, especially with what Kayla and Amanda just said is, um, you know, certainly these, some of these birds are the same species that we uh, work with here at the zoo, St. Louis Zoo, because part of the conservation work takes place um, in zoos here in, in the United States. But to be able to go there and actually see those same birds uh, where they're supposed to be and doing what they're supposed to do is, uh, it's just really moving. It's a moving experience, that's for sure. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing everyone. This was wonderful. I learned so much. Um, I'm very jealous you got to see a fruit bat and a coconut crab, Kayla, and all of those wonderful birds that Amanda and Matt get to work with. It's really cool to see. Um, so for everyone else, we have one more happy hour coming next Thursday at 5.30 in the Z. Ron Gellner Center for Hellbender Conservation. So we hope to see you there. And if you want to know more about the uh, center we talked about today or any of our other wild care centers, you can go to stlzoo.org slash wild care. So I hope you have a great rest of your evening. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone.